Tonight's lecture, Courthouses in West Virginia. Tonight, uh, Patty Hamilton, Executive Director of the West Virginia Association of Counties, will moderate a presentation on West Virginia courthouses. Mike Goulis, Historic Preservation Consultant, Melissa Smith, Executive Director of the West Virginia Courthouse Facilities Improvement Authority, and Deborah, she will not be here. The, uh, they are all uh, co-presenters -pres with uh, Patty Hamilton tonight. Patty has served as the Executive Director of the West Virginia Association of Counties since October 1997. She is a graduate of West Virginia University and earned a master's degree in management public administration from the West Virginia Graduate College. Hamilton is past president of the National Council of County Association Executives and of the Conference of Southern County Associations and currently is a board member of the West Virginia Society of Association Executives. Under her leadership, the, West, the association made the video tribute to the state's courthouses for West Virginia public broadcasting. The film won the 2011 Spirit of West Virginia Award from the Division of Tourism and was nominated for an Emmy. The presentation led to a full-color book featuring all 55 county courthouses, West Virginia's Living Monuments to Courthouses, is actually the book that just recently came out in 2013. Please welcome Patty and her guests. Thank you so much. It is just a pleasure to be here because we are so proud of our courthouses and our, we are very proud of our book and movie that we think uh, will memorialize courthouses into the future. And um, I wanted to give you a little bit of the background of getting this started. I actually saw a movie that Georgia had done for their courthouses. And Georgia has a huge number of counties, something like 167 counties. 159. And, okay, a bunch. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, so so we, 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 I'll, I'll get the question, but don't you think West Virginia has too many counties and there's a lot of states that have a whole, whole lot more and a whole lot uh, smaller than our smallest, which is work. But um, at any rate, I thought, what a great idea. You know, to, we don't have anything that really celebrates our courthouses. Um, so I took the idea to PBS, and this has to have been at least six years ago or more. And they thought it was a wonderful idea. Just, they'd love to have it in their archives and so on and so forth. And, and blessed me and go out and seek money. Um, okay. <laughs> so something like three or four years later, um, and especially with our, our uh, major sponsor came on, West Virginia Courthouse Facilities Improvement Authority, we, we finally had enough money to do the movie. And we were getting we, sponsors and sales and so on. And, and I uh, raise my hat to anyone who does fundraising for a living because it is not easy. A lot of work. So we got the movie done. And I really, I, I call it a labor of love. Deb and Richard Warmuth of the Walkabout Company Wheeling were the connection that West Virginia PBS made for me because I didn't know anything about making no movies. So they were uh, producers, they had done several documentaries <clears throat> for PBS, and they loved courthouses. And they did a lot of work in the years when we had very little money. So I do call it a labor of love on their part. Um, they brought in Mike Gillis as the historic preservation consultant and then Dr. Michael Workman in, at West Virginia State was their history consultant, and it was those two Michaels that, uh, and their team that selected the courthouses for the movie. I wanted no part of that because I didn't want to show any favoritism in any county. Um, the courthouses for the movie were selected for their history, their architecture, or both. Um, so it, it's a nice mixture, I think. I think one Michael thinks there's not enough history in the movie, and the other one thinks there's not quite enough architecture in the movie, but I think it's a nice balance. And, and you will see that we truly have some spectacular courthouses in both their history and their architecture. And uh, the movie was released in 2011, and we had a premiere right here at the Culture Center. One thing that we found in doing the movie and, the, and later the book 
is people who love courthouses just come out of the woodwork. Um, we got antique postcards of courthouses. I didn't even know such a thing existed. And people shared them with us. This book has over 500 photographs. Some of these photographs were given to Deb and Richard Warmoth solely for the book, and they cannot be used for any other purpose, some of these historic photographs. And so there are really some treasures in this book. Um, <clears throat> the book started because we had so much material for the movie collected that it seemed a shame not to carry the project on and feature all 55 courthouses in a book. So that's how the movie turned into a book. And, and we think we have really left a legacy for West Virginia. And fortunately, the book came out in 2013, which is our 150th birthday. So we thought that was a nice coinciding of historic events. I wanted to read you just a paragraph of what the authors say about the movie. Deb was going to be here, and then she had to have a medical procedure, and her husband Richard was going to be here, but he was in pipe stem at a book show, and there's getting some nasty weather in Wheeling tonight, and he thought he'd better not be on the roads after 7.30, so, so he left it up to us. But I think you'll get a flavor of how they felt about this project, just from this one paragraph. And this is the, the author's notes at the, start, at the start of the book. In creating this book, we had the great fortune to travel to each county in the state, often more than once. This afforded us the opportunity to meet and talk with the people that actually work in the courthouses. Perhaps the overarching quality that we observed is that everyone we met was welcoming and genuinely friendly. They are quite proud of their courthouse, usually taking time to point out interesting features or convey some of the history associated with their part of the state. While we certainly bear a prejudice in favor of our courthouses, it's the people that you meet inside that most often makes the journey a memorable and satisfying experience. And I just thought that was a lovely part of their story about writing the book. I want to start this out with about 15 minutes of the movie. The first 15 minutes shows some really good stories and, and I think rather than me standing here telling you the stories it's it's best to see them in the movie. So, I'm sorry I didn't bring popcorn.
our county system of government has its origins in colonial America. Well, the, the concept of a county, uh, for many of us, goes back to England and the Shire, but the, the word actually is, has, a, has a French origin. Because when the Euro European settlers came over here, uh, despite the fact that they were English, they didn't establish shires, they established counties. And the reason for the county, particularly in areas like West Virginia, um, which was then part of Virginia, is that population was so sparsely uh, scattered that a town wouldn't work as it did in New England. So in New England, you have a town with a meeting house. In areas like Virginia, you're going to have a county, which incorporates a, a, a much larger area. And each of those counties is going to have a county courthouse. As people moved west and new counties were formed in western Virginia, the courthouse often had a humble beginning. The early courts were often in private homes. The first courthouse of Greenbrier County, then Virginia in 1778, was designated by the Virginia General Assembly as the home of John Stewart. As people moved west, uh, as you know, in, in terms of Virginia, as they came west, you have land claims. You have uh, all kinds of legal issues. So from the very beginning, you have to have some place where that is accomplished. And so you identify a place where you're going to have court, and then you have court days. And if you read some of the old documents that date back to the 18th century, some of these court days were, were pretty wild places. You're going to have hundreds, if not thousands, of people show up because it's not only a place where you do legal business, it's also a place where you can come and meet people, uh, come and uh, maybe trade various kinds of items, maybe sell some things. And it's a combination uh, legal get-together and uh, party particularly because these folks are scattered all over hills and dales, all over the area. The more rural the, the area, the more likely that uh, court day is going to be a big issue. And that's why if you look at even some very small towns that have courthouses, they're likely to have taverns, they're likely to have some kind of inn, uh, they're likely to have some kind of businesses that will uh, provide services to those folks who are coming in for a day, maybe two days, some of them might here, be here for a week. Courthouses were natural gathering places. This was especially true when the county court was in session and town brimmed with visitors, and court days often became general trade days. With the rise of industry in the 19th century, the importance for a town being the county seat and possessing the courthouse grew. It was, on occasion, a matter of intense rivalry between communities. In 1790, the Randolph County seat was in Beverly, a small but thriving farming town that also benefited greatly from trade along the Staunton Parkersburg Turnpike. And so it remained for over a hundred years. In 1889, Stephen B. Elkins and Henry Gassaway Davis built the West Virginia Central and Pittsburgh Railroad into the Tigard Valley to develop the area's timber and coal resources. By 1890, the new town of Elkins, bearing the name of its founder, was located just seven miles north of Beverly. With its railroad yard, Elkins soon eclipsed Beverly in both size and wealth. This shift in economic power triggered a struggle for political control and the location of the county seat. The issue was put to a public vote, with the first victory going to Beverly. However, the dissatisfied residents of Elkins quickly complained that the courthouse in Beverly was too small. A new one was constructed in 1894, but it lasted only three years. The ill-fated courthouse was destroyed by a fire in 1897, with each side blaming the other for the blaze. The dispute became so serious that in May 1898, Beverly Sheriff deputized 100 citizens. Armed with rifles and dynamite, the defenders dug trenches around the courthouse to prepare for an impending assault from Elkins. 
The confrontation was averted at the last minute, and in 1900, Elkins won the county seat. A new courthouse was completed in the early 1900s and was referred to as one of the most handsome, substantial, and conveniently arranged temples of justice in the state of West Virginia. Sitting as a prominent feature of downtown Elkins, the native stone facade emphasizes the strength and mass of the building, and at the time of its completion was a genuine statement about the power of industrial development in Elkins. The detailed arched windows and doorways add elegance to this outstanding architectural design. In Tucker County, the original county seat was St. George. When the county voted to move the courthouse to Parsons, there were legal delays. Some residents of Parsons grew weary of the wait and organized a vigilante committee of more than 200 armed men. They broke into the courthouse, confiscated all the records, and even took the bell hanging in the courthouse tower. A temporary courthouse was established in Parsons in a store on Main Street. The court continued to operate out of the store until a permanent courthouse was constructed. Tucker County was the site of an important civil rights case 61 years before Brown versus Board of Education reached the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1893, Carrie Williams, a black school teacher at the Colored School, continued teaching after school officials shortened the term at her school from eight to five months. Williams retained John Robert Clifford, the first African American admitted to the bar in West Virginia as her counsel. Clifford successfully sued the school board for her salary for the full school term, and the decision was upheld by the West Virginia Supreme Court, making Williams the first case in US history to hold that racial discrimination in school terms and teacher pay is against the law. In Wyoming County, tempers flared in a three-way contest for the location of the courthouse. Voters finally decided to move the county seat from its original location in Oceana to Pineville. There also was strong opposition from the residents of Mullins, who wanted the courthouse in their community. The issue was finally put to rest with the court decision and the records were moved to Pineville. Located on a hillside overlooking the town of Pineville, the Wyoming County Courthouse was built in neoclassical revival style, with full-height porches and large classic columns. It was constructed with locally cut stone and sits atop a broad, terraced columns. The parapet along the roof line adds an almost castle-like quality. The courthouse is topped with a richly detailed clock tower. The jail, constructed of the same native cut stone, was built in 1930 with funds from the Works Progress Administration. Centered in the long series of steps that form the front approach is a statue of Reverend W. H. Cook, a soldier, statesman, and minister. He was one of the area's first European settlers. Inside the courthouse, a formal entryway provides an expansive and comfortable waiting area for citizens. of disputes. Fairmont was well established as the Marion County seat. However, as the 19th century drew to a close, to many the old courthouse seemed too small and not befitting a growing industrial community. This courthouse was opened in 1900, but we had a little courthouse before this when the Marion County became a county in 1842 while we got ourselves a courthouse and put it together. It was red brick, 
It was charming, had columns in front and all that sort of thing. And, but after a while, it became too small. It became uh, run down, and the community started to worry, the county started to worry about its courthouse. And there were, there's a movement to have a new courthouse. Well, there were arguments, always the same arguments, they don't change. Uh, not enough money, we don't need it, and et cetera. And so some of the, the arguments were, well, they weren't getting any place. And so some of the citizenry, rumor has it the sheriff was in the group, got together one evening and with their pickaxes and shovels or hammers, sledgehammers, what, whatever they could find. And I, rumor has it, and it's probably a pretty good rumor, that there were several barrels of whiskey also. I kind of made a party out of it. And they attacked that little courthouse, and they tore it down, and then they had their pictures taken standing on the rubble. Now, <laughs> that seems a little strange to me, but I guess it didn't bother anybody. Well, when the people got up the next morning, their courthouse was gone. They were forced into, whether they had the money or not, whether they wanted it or not, they were forced into building a new courthouse. Well, the people were upset, of course, and but they settled down and started work on this a beautiful new courthouse. The Marion County Courthouse stands in grand testimony to the community's rise as a leading industrial center in the state. Completed in 1900, this massive and impressive courthouse dominates the center of town. Constructed in the Beaux Arts style, it immediately demands attention with its monumental dome. Interestingly, the dome itself is actually cast iron. It is painted to look like the stone to blend in with the rest of the building. Expansive approaches invite the public to enter, and elaborate design detailing provides a rich visual environment, a statement of the importance of the business conducted within. The artistic style is carried to the interior with a high, ornate rotunda capped by the interior of the massive dome. High vaulted ceilings with intricate ornamentation are reminiscent of a grand European palace. Murals unique to the courthouse are located at each end of the arched hallways. Painted by individual artists, the murals depict significant parts of the county's history. almost like a church. Uh, people, like when they come to visit the courtroom, uh, they'll, they'll speak in a whisper uh, so as not to disturb. I, I, think, I think the courtroom represents the people justice. I think most people have an abiding faith in, in our system of justice, and uh, I think the courtroom represents that to them. the judge's bench. Raised above the surrounding courtroom, it commands attention and conveys the importance of the matters before the court. The courtroom was frequently the center of community interest. The theater-style seating and a balcony could accommodate a large audience that would attend trials, often as a form of entertainment. The courtroom is decorated with artwork to represent the desire for justice. Various carefully crafted architectural elements add to the beauty and dignity of the room. Located in the center of the ceiling, a large skylight not only provides an extra source of light, it too adds to the overall beauty of the courtroom design. Larger, grand courthouses began to appear across the state. They were designed to stand as proud symbols of democracy and freedom. However, on the practical side, they also represented a community's political and economic influence. The, the courthouse is a representation of the government of and by the people. And whether you come from a large county or a small county, 
What goes on in the courthouse, in the minds of local residents, is important. And as a consequence of that, uh, many people would want to make sure that their courthouse looks like an important building. So when you go into some of these towns, they might be small, but all of a sudden, right here in this square, is a building that maybe is the only building in town that's made out of stone, uh, or in some cases brick, when everything else is made out of wood. And that building wants to tell us something. And what that building tells us is what goes on here is important. The people know that it's important. Uh, and you want everybody to, to look at that building and say, wow. So it might be taller than most. Uh, it might have some kind of dome on it. Uh, it might have uh, various kinds of statues out front. Uh, it might have a certain kind of landscaping. But whatever, it's, it's going to attract people's interest. And even if you had never heard of the word courthouse, you would know when you looked at that building, this is obviously an important place. Well, I, I think the, the, the different, very... flavor of the, the movie and courthouses generally and some of the really beautiful features. The segment just about to come on there was uh, about Knoll County and I know I see it almost every day and didn't appreciate some of the detail that is on the building until I saw this movie and I also didn't appreciate the fact that the Knoll County Courthouse is enormous. It is an entire city block. It just had never registered on it before. So I think this brings out details that that you just don't appreciate and notice. How many of you have gone into a town and you immediately identify the courthouse even if you don't know your way around? You know, I, it, that's the importance of the county seat and the, as the historian was talking about, the, the importance of the building itself. You can almost always find the courthouse even if you really have no idea where it is in the town. And with that, uh, I will turn it over to Mike Giolis. Since I, I wasn't going to cut out the first 11 slides, but now that Deb and Richard are not here, uh, I get to speak for them, and I get to speak about architecture, more about history, so, so that, that worked out really well for me. Um, uh, as, so the, the first section will be discussing uh, the courthouses in general, their architecture, and how beautiful they are, as we have seen, and how varied they are. Uh, and then the second section will discuss why the reasons why we rehabilitate or restore or repair our courthouses and why we should do that. Um, as David said in the video, the, uh, the courthouses are very significant to our citizens. Uh, sometimes they're the only contact that a citizen has with government, either federal or local county. Uh, and so they are very symbolic uh, in their importance, uh, besides being a building themselves. And I'll, I'll try to hit on some of that dichotomy that a courthouse uh, imbues. Uh, Thomas Jefferson has a quote about public buildings. I won't read the whole thing, but the important thing is outlined in red there. And his opinion was that public buildings should be constructed of durable materials, and so he meant stone and brick and mortar and masonry. Um, and if you look around our state and any other state, you'll see that most of the courthouses are constructed of uh, masonry materials. They're meant to last a long time. They're meant to signify durability, the durability of our government, because it is long-lasting. Uh, and the durability of the people. And so uh, we seem to be following Jefferson 
in all we do. Let's see if this works out. Okay. Um, the courthouse is, as I said, and as David said, really have two functions. One is to uh, house the county's programs and functions. It's basically an office building for the county. Uh, one of the most important functions, of course, is the uh, courtroom or the county court. Uh, so that's not an office, but that's a very important function. But then there's day-to-day -day activities that go on in a courthouse. You pay your taxes there, you pay your dog taxes, your property taxes, everything else. Uh, you go there to uh, get information, you go there to attend county commission meetings and things like that. Uh, so there's back office operations in the courthouse. So besides being a symbol of democracy and freedom, the courthouse has to function as an office building and function very well as a building. Um, so we're, we're trying to balance the functional aspects of the courthouse with the symbolic uh, aspects of the courthouse. And here, uh, function, we have the courtroom, uh, deed and other records files, and then just general storage files and administrative uh, activities occur in the building. But then the edifice that houses all of those functions has to also convey some kind of a symbolic representation to the people of the community. And so you see, as the video stated, most courthouses are on a slight rise or they're in a prominent location in the downtown. They're slightly taller than most of the other buildings. They're of architectural styles that are impressive and large uh, uh, for their function. Uh, they often have towers, clock towers, or other uh, domes or other uh, accoutrements that make them stand out in the uh, downtown. And then, of course, on the interior, the major symbolic feature is the courtroom itself. And most of the courtrooms we saw during the production of the book, and then I was able to participate in an inspection of all 55 county courthouses this past year. Uh, most of the court courtrooms we saw were symbolic, uh, such as the ones that are illustrated here. Uh, and then there's other details in the building, generally towards the entrances, uh, to show how important the building you are in is. The courthouses around the state uh, are of varied architectural styles. They generally follow the style that was prominent at the time that they were built. These, these I believe, are the court, these are not a comprehensive list of all the courthouses and what style they are, but it is a list of the ones that are in the video and the styles that they are uh, from the courthouses that are in the video. And you can see that the architectural styles span the entire history of American architecture from uh, early Greek Revival uh, and uh, federal style architecture all the way through Art Deco. We have a couple of really nice Art Deco courthouses in the state. And then we even have uh, modernist uh, and international style courthouses in the state uh, as well as now our newest co courthouses can be considered a postmodernist uh, style, architectural style. Uh, that one is not in the video, but it is in the book. Um, most of the courthouses in West Virginia are recognized as being historically significant. Uh, in 2003, the State Historic Preservation Office did a uh, uh, multiple property documentation for courthouses, and in that documentation, the list came out to be uh, 47 of them were deemed to be either uh, listed on the National Register of Historic Places individually uh, or listed within a historic district uh, or eligible for listing. The one, uh, unfortunately, that I was just talking about, Morgan County, was on that list of eligible properties, but it uh, has since uh, uh, burnt uh, in a fire, unfortunately. But they do have a beautiful courthouse uh, to replace it. All right, so now on to why, why do we want to rehabilitate courthouses? Uh, and I, I think the answer is pretty obvious uh, from what we've all been talking and what we saw in the video is that the courthouse really is uh, an important structure in our community 
Uh, it not only functions for the purposes that we need to visit courthouses for, but it also acts as a center of the community. A lot of the courthouses have uh, public meetings and public functions there, as well as doing the court business. Um, I'll go through a series of slides that explain various reasons and uh, alternatives to rehabilitation and restoration. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, though, is that I, I'm trying not to pick out any particular courthouse. The, most of the slides, because we're discussing why we need to rehabilitate buildings, uh, are negative. They show uh, deficiencies in the building or they show reasons we would want to do something to the building. So they may look a little negative. And I, I'm not trying to pick out any courthouse and I'm not trying to be negative about them. I'm just showing what we saw when we did inspections of all 55 of the courthouses to show what the courthouses need and why it's important to keep them, uh, keep them up and rehabilitate them. Um, starting with the solidity and the masonry aspect of the courthouses, one of the reasons you might want to rehabilitate a courthouse is just because things deteriorate with age. Uh, everything deteriorates with age. We do, I have, uh, our cars, our houses, our appliances, they just get old. Uh, and there's nothing wrong about the building, there's nothing negative to say about the building, things just deteriorate. Uh, and here you can see some of them just deteriorate in general, some deterioration is related to moisture and water, uh, which erodes stones. Uh, a lot of the courthouses in West Virginia are constructed of sandstone, which is a relatively soft material uh, in terms of stone materials, and so water and wind and uh, people rubbing against it erode the stone. Um, this one from the Kanawha County Courthouse, that entire column was deteriorated or eroded enough that you couldn't tell it originally had some architectural detail to it. So, so in general, one of the reasons we want to rehabilitate them is just to keep them operational and to repair them. Uh, the same thing happens with brick buildings, not only stone buildings. Uh, and you can see some logical locations uh, right here where water would come up, the snow and water and ice would splash up on the building. The water uh, from that snow and ice would get into the brick and mortar and deteriorate it. And so that's just a natural progression. It's not anything negative about the building. And then in some cases where it's difficult to get out of building at the top of the building, it's difficult to get up there and inspect it or get up there and repair it, uh, we do have some deterioration as a result of that. Um, sometimes rehabilitation occurs again uh, in, in just materials wear out. Uh, slate that we use on our courthouses here in West Virginia um, has a life expectancy. Uh, some of the poorer quality slate that was used in some cases uh, came from Pennsylvania. Uh, some of that slate has a life expectancy of about 75 to 90 years. Uh, some of the current slate or some other slates around the country, uh, such as from Vermont um, or New York State or Canada, have a life expectancy of about 120 years and some of the more high-grade slate uh, coming from Virginia mostly has a life expectancy of about 150 years. But if a building lasts 100 years, that means the slate has worn out. Um, and it wears out from, again, rain and erosion, uh, hail, snow, things like that. The copper materials we use to flash the slate uh, and to attach the slate to the roof uh, have a life expectancy of about 40 to 60 years. So uh, those fasteners and those uh, flashings fail, uh, which allows water into the building. And the same is true with uh, clay tile roofs, very prominent on a lot of our uh, courthouses in West Virginia because of the architectural style. Uh, and the same is true also of metal roofs. Metal roofs have a life expectancy of maybe about 100 years if you keep them up. Uh, you have to paint them. Original metal roofs on courthouses were a turn coated, which is a lead coating uh, or a lead uh, alloy coating on steel. And so if you did not paint them, the lead alloy would erode and then the steel would start rusting. So if they were painted, they would last 90 years, but if they were not, they would not. Um, and then the, uh, the
clay tile has a life expectancy of about 140 to 150 years, but as I said, the fasteners uh, have a life expectancy of 60, and that's where the problems come in. When the fasteners fail and a tile slips or moves and water can get in behind it uh, and start deteriorating the roof. So here's a composite example of a rehabilitation project here in Kanawha County on the Kanawha County Courthouse where the roof was replaced, oops, sorry. The roof was, re <laughs> keep pressing the wrong button. The roof was replaced totally, uh, all of the flashings, uh, and then we came back and did a total stone rehabilitation and stone cleaning. And then in the bottom slide over here, you can see the test sample we set up initially throughout the entire life of the project to show how clean we wanted it to be. Uh, and then you can also see uh, where they have cleaned and where they have not cleaned yet as they work in their way around the building. Uh, other age-related or uh, deterioration or just uh, system-related uh, rehabilitation, um, sometimes the systems, uh, the heating system changes from coal-fired, although we do have, I think, two coal-fired uh, courthouses in the state. I think it's two or three. Um, but there are other systems now for running a boiler and some of them may be more efficient. Um, we also have sometimes deterioration of the plaster just from people rubbing against it or leaning against it or from water entering. Uh, and then other types of uh, changes in, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in water supplies. Some of the original courthouses didn't have hot water when they were built, uh, so we've added materials to them uh, toilets and other functional activities. And then uh, in some of our additions to the courthouse and adding the modern technology, which we now all use and now all need, um, you can see that sometimes care was not always taken on how to introduce those modern elements into a building. Um, it's, it's easy to start out with one telephone cord and just nail it against the top of the wainscoting there, and then it's painted out and it doesn't look bad, but then the next one comes and the next one comes, and soon you have a whole, a whole mess like that there, and then you can see how much modern systems and equipment and utilities we use in a courthouse and in most of our buildings. We have uh, computer communications, telephone, we have the Supreme Court uh, communications, we have electricity, uh, and it all has to go somewhere in a historic building or sometimes outside of a historic building. Uh, so we want to rehabilitate the building to remove some of that detrimental material. Uh, and sometimes it wasn't even just not knowing uh, that we were doing something wrong. In, in one case, the installation of a handicap accessible uh, lift uh, necessitated, or in, in the eye of whoever was installing it, necessitated cutting a historic newel post. Uh, and it would at least have been nice if they had at least painted it so you wouldn't see the cut right there. Uh, and in another case, uh, installation of an air handling unit in an attic, they cut out portions of the trusses in order to install the air handling unit and never put the trusses back. So sometimes we have to reverse activities that were done, whether they were, even if they were well-meaning. Uh, and sometimes it's just repairs, again, just because of deterioration. Coping stones at the top of the buildings usually fail. Uh, caulk and uh, mortar uh, has a life expectancy of a caulk about five to seven years, mortar about 10, 15 years, and so we, we need to keep replenishing these materials in order to keep them, uh, keep the parapet walls secure. The parapet wall is the wall that's at the top of a building. Uh, keep moisture out of that wall, and if we don't, we end up having to repair it, like this one here. And, and then, in this case, there's probably moisture that got into that joint. Uh, it rusted the pin that's holding the stone in, and then when steel rusts, it expands and it popped off that, that piece of stone there. Um, and in this one you saw in the video a beautiful view of the Marion County Courthouse 
and they stole my thunder because I was going to let you know that it's all cast iron, uh, everything above the roof line, uh, but that cast iron does have to be maintained. Uh, and so there is a project planned right now for that. So I hope I haven't told you. Um, and it's not only the old courthouses. It's not only the ones that are 100 years old or 120 years old or 75 years old. There are some that are 20, 30, 40 years old that also have problems. Sometimes the problem is inherent in the design. Uh, in this case, the design included a built-in gutter in a suspect location. And as a result, water, you can see water is getting into the wall itself and dripping out. We were lucky to be on site uh, during a rainstorm, so that really helped us analyze the building. Uh, and then on the interior of the building, you can see that water gets into the, that was the library uh, room, uh, and deteriorates the interior finishes. So it's not always age and erosion or deterioration, it's also uh, sometimes just bad design. Uh, and they did it historically, it's not only uh, current. Um, sometimes rehabilitation is necessitated by changes in the way we conduct our business. Uh, most of you all, many of you all may work in the county courthouse or may have been in the county courthouse. So these views are not uncommon to you, not unfamiliar. Um, there's an awful lot of material that has to be stored in the county courthouse. Uh, and by law, it has to be kept. Uh, and there's an awful lot of space in the county courthouse that is devoted to storing materials. Now, sometimes uh, they store it in better conditions than others, but it has to be stored. Uh, we ran into conditions where they ran out of space, so they started stacking file cabinets on top of file cabinets uh, in a room that probably was not designed to carry that kind of a load. Um, and then that occurs in the offices too. There's more and more people, there's more and more activities in a courtroom, and so, I mean, in a courthouse, and so the building becomes more and more crowded. Sometimes things become obsolete. Uh, the jails in all of our courthouses are no longer used uh, because we have the regional jail system. And so, in some cases, the jail ends up being just a storage repository uh, for a lot of that material. Uh, and in some cases, it gets reused. In Mason County, the jail was converted into a, uh, the family court, uh, the judge's courtroom, uh, the courtroom itself, and the judge's offices and waiting rooms. Uh, and in uh, Lewis County, which is sort of an ironic twist, the uh, jail became the offices for the sheriff's office, and so the deputies have their own little cubicles inside the jail cells themselves. It was, it was pretty cool. And then there are upgrades to meet current systems and utility needs. As you can see, uh, lighting has changed over the years. Our use of lighting has changed over the years. We use a lot more than we used to because we used to just rely on uh, a lot on natural lighting from windows. Uh, and then uh, heating and cooling. These courthouses never had cooling. They now do, most of them. Uh, so we have to introduce new elements into the building. Um, this is a space in Mason County that was an antechamber to the uh, courtroom. It's no longer used for that function. So again, it, it gets walled off from the corridor and gets used as a storage space. And then here you can see the addition of a heating unit and then modern uh, uh, Xerox and scanning equipment, uh, which all require new wiring uh, and new utilities to be put back in the building. Um, so we have to make upgrades to new codes, codes that didn't exist at the time uh, for various reasons. And one of the more common themes that we saw in our inspections was meeting the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, as you can see here in Mason County, we have a beautiful uh, vestibule at the entrance, and then this is the main entrance of the building. But because of ADA uh, accessibility issues and security accessibility issues, uh, they don't use this front entrance, uh, and so this entire space on the interior is unused. Um, and then the same, you can see how daunting getting up to that door would be for somebody in the 
wheelchair, and then there's the little sign over here that says go around to the side. Uh, and then upgrades on the interior as well to meet ADA standards. Uh, it'd be a little tight to get a wheelchair in that toilet. Uh, and then what we found was even in the courtroom themselves, the jury boxes and the witness stands uh, all were elevated for reasons, for functional reasons and for symbolic reasons, uh, and yet they are inaccessible to somebody in a wheelchair. <clears throat> And then, of course, our security issues. Things have changed, especially since 911 or 911, uh, uh, or even before that. And so now we have to introduce scanners and security desks and everything at all entrances, and then scanners at the entrances to the courtroom itself. So, um, and then I just threw this in because I thought it was really cool. It's technology that has changed. These uh, little rooms are pretty much obsolete these days with cell phones, uh, but yet I would not want to uh, recommend that they be removed. Uh, this one here was being used as a storage closet, uh, and, and the other ones were just unused. Uh, and then to end on a slightly upscale note, I wanted to talk about restoration. One of the real reasons to rehabilitate a court house is to restore the sim symbolism and beauty that it originally had. Uh, and so this is, oops, that, that's the Jefferson County Courthouse and on the top, and uh, I won't venture a guess on the other ones. But you can see the courtroom itself uh, is significant as a space, but then the details in the courtrooms are significant as well. The, the desks, the walls, the materials are all important. Uh, and generally, the main entrance and the stairways up from the main entrance have the most detail. Even modern stairways have some kind of a detail or flair to them. Uh, and as you saw, the Marion County Courthouse in the video and then other courthouses have uh, domes, vaults in the rotunda, and then uh, domes and uh, stained glass in the courtroom itself and in other locations. Uh, and then some of the details. Uh, again, a lot of the details occur in stairways, handrails, and decorative newel posts. But then even some of the vaults are pretty incredible when you go behind the scenes and see the surrounds around the large vaults that are walk in. And then this was just a little round thing about that big that uh, they used to store materials in. Uh, and then one thing that most people never see, but maybe see the results of, uh, almost, not almost all, but a lot of the courthouses have clocks that uh, serve a function for the public. Um, and the behind the scenes views of the clocks, and in fact, Melissa helped crank one of them uh, during the site visits, uh, are decorative, very decorative, but functional historic clock works. Uh, this is in Marion County again, and the clockworks drive uh, a rod that turns the clock faces, and sometimes they have four rods for all four faces. We but in, this that looks just exactly like the clockwork. Yeah, yeah, they have a lot of them, uh, and the greens are almost always painted green, uh, the clockworks. Um, but the unique thing that we didn't see anywhere else about Marion County's clock is that it also had a rod and universal joint system that drove the clocks that were in the rotunda and in the courtroom itself. So the rods went all the way down two floors uh, and then drove all of those clocks also. So it was really pretty neat. Um, and as I said, this is our newest courthouse in the state. Uh, so we would like to see this one and all the others preserved for the future uh, and for future use. And with that, I'll let Melissa talk about how that gets done.
very much for having us here tonight. It's an honor uh, to be able to speak to a group like this about our courthouses, people that appreciate the history and the architecture of the buildings themselves. I'll put our website up there in case you want to jot that down and you can check our website occasionally just to get a view of some of our new projects that we're working on. And then I also put my email address in case you would have a question that comes up after you go home tonight. You can email me anytime and, and I'll get back in touch with you. Uh, we are on our 11th cycle of funding. The legislature implemented us about 12 years ago. And I think uh, at that time they could see that construction costs had increased at just a magnificent amount and counties were struggling to keep up with their buildings. As most of you uh, may know, property taxes are collected at the county level and about 70% of property taxes actually goes to education. So the counties are left with about 30% or not even that much, I don't think, Patty, right? Because some of, there's two or three percent that go elsewhere. And so uh, we are left, the counties are left with less than 30% of your property tax that you send to them to run the sheriff's office, the court system, everything contained in the courthouse, and plus maintain the building. And it's just, it's just crazy what it costs. I, that's what I handed out those spreadsheets and you can take a look there and see uh, some of the various projects that we have funded over the past three years. Uh, one of the sheets is front and back. But that's just to give you an idea. Those are some of our small, those are some of the projects that we fund and I would consider them all small. We, the, the largest amount of money that we give out is $100,000. And then the county has to provide a 20% match. So at this time they have to, if they apply for $100,000, they have to put in $25,000 to match that amount. Now some of them choose to do smaller projects as well, but I just thought I would hand that out, give you guys an idea of how much construction costs actually are. And each year our agency brings in around roughly $2.1 million. And that's to, for us to distribute to all 55 counties. So when you start breaking that down, it's not much. So because of that, our grant, our grant projects, are, they are competitive and every county is not funded each year. We fund about 23 to 25 projects a year. Um, and we try to help those counties that may not have a grant writer. They can call me and I'll try to help them with their application. We also provide grant training. So we try to make it a little bit, um, we try to give those smaller counties a little bit of a, a head start if they, if they so desire. Of course, some of them choose not to have that extra help. But so, and we fund the larger counties as well. Um, I brought a few pictures here. Oh, which button? This one. Okay. This is uh, the Hardy County Courthouse, and this was a brick repointing project. And these are some of the pictures that they submitted to us with their grant application. With each application, you have to send pictures, and there's also a, a written application. And we have an uh, independent architect that scores the applications. But there you can see some of the damage. And then the next picture shows you the after pictures. And you can see how, how much better the stucco looks. And, but, and that's on one of those sheets. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly how much we gave them for this project. But that was one of our recent projects. Um, and I included this picture. I was going to see if you guys... When they sent me their after pictures, I wasn't as much interested in the brick repointing as I was something else that stood out to me. Anybody want to comment on the bottom pictures? See anything strange about those bottom pictures? Well, these windows... And then, I'm sure that was a window. No, that one is on another side. Okay. It's like a side entrance of the company. But anyway, when I opened that up, uh, since I 
have learned a little bit about the historical significance of the building itself. I was like, the first thing that popped in my mind was, oh, oh my goodness, they didn't close the windows. <laughs> so which, that wasn't one of our projects. So uh, we, would, we would actually not allow a project like that. They probably paid for that with their county funds. But, and then they covered up the one window. But I think uh, sometimes they've done that along throughout the years for energy efficiency and and, and some of our ceilings, we saw some of our beautiful ceilings uh, in Barber County. They had this gorgeous uh, ceiling and uh, skylight. And a few years ago, the judge up there, it was a uh, it was a ceiling like this, a drop ceiling. And he was he was a new judge in that county. And he said, you know, what's above the ceiling? Because it obviously didn't match the time period for when the building was built. And so he looked and he was just like, oh my goodness, that's crazy. So the county paid to have their ceiling restored. And it's gorgeous now. If you ever go through Philippi, stop in there. And they're very, they're very proud of it. So I'm sure if somebody had the time, they would take you up there. I, you know, the outside of that building, I'm like, well, you know, it's pretty. And I appreciate it. But when I went in the courtroom, I, I didn't know the story. When I first went in, I sat down and I was like, Oh my goodness, I was just blown away that that was in that building, but it's just gorgeous. It took the cupola totally off of the building and took it off somewhere and fixed it to the exact standards. The State Historic Preservation Office helped them to make sure they were matching the proper uh, materials. And so today, it looks like that. Just a really cool project. This is Tucker County, uh, a deterioration of the brick on our front balcony. And that's the area today. That's one of the sheets I sent out to you. You can see these, these are our newest grants, the 11th cycle. We can't really see it here, but it's on one of the sheets that I sent around. Uh, for example, Gilmer County, they're waterproofing their basement, removing mold, and installing drains. And it's their grant their grant is $84,000, and they have to pay on top of that to match. So, and their basement is from me to those bookshelves. It's not very big. I, I, you know, it's just it's just unbelievable how much the projects cost. But our fees are brought in. It's not tax dollars. It's uh, there's different things collected in each office of the courthouse. Uh, the concealed weapons permit we get fifteen dollars from. The marriage license we get ten dollars from. Uh, magistrate court fee we get two dollars from. Sometimes <laughs> we don't always get it. Um, you know, some of these considered destitute then they don't pay some their whole court fee sometimes. So sometimes we don't get all of that. But so we just the legislature found that that would be the best way to pull everybody's money together. And it's kind of like a savings account. Uh, for me, especially, you know, if I take something automatically out of my paycheck and it goes into my savings account, then I, I don't worry about it. I don't spend it, it's there. And whereas if it drops into my checking account, then I spend it. So it's kind of a, I look at it like that, you know, the county every month they send their fees into their savings account at the state treasurer's office and then once a year they can apply for grants to, and then they get that back. And, and sometimes it's not equal, you know, Ward County doesn't send us very much, but they might get $80,000 and they may, they probably haven't sent us $80,000 in 10 years. So, so sometimes it's not, maybe not quite fair in that regard, but we were hoping to help the smaller counties out a little bit and still help the larger counties. So we we think it's the most fair way to have an independent architect judge the applications. And I think it's worked out really well. And also it has seemed to make or encourage counties to have master plans and actually because they have to think about it every year, you know, well what are we going to apply for? And sometimes when they don't get funded they'll go ahead with the project with their full county funds. So kind of helps in that regard also. Um, and with that, I will turn it back over to Patty and maybe we'll take some questions. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Melissa. <clears throat> I wanted to, um, we'll leave time for 
questions or comments or courthouse stories that, that you all might have. But I thought I'd, I'd close with one of my favorite, I have a lot of favorite stories and, and uh, Michael and I were talking, I, I, I sometimes think I, I have a favorite courthouse and then I change my mind and so I won't really say what's, what a favorite courthouse is. There are some truly, truly spectacular ones when you drive into a town and, it, and it's hard to say and sometimes if it's a gorgeous day in Elkins, the Randolph County Courthouse will just take your breath away or, or things like that. And then one time I was at the Tucker County Courthouse and there was a wall of snow on either like five feet of snow <laughs> entranceway as you're walking into, into uh, the courthouse. But this is a story from Greenbrier County, and it's, it's a great story that's included in the book. <clears throat> there are many colorful events that are part of a courthouse history, and the Greenbrier County Courthouse is considered to be the location in which testimony from a ghost helped to convict a murderer. Zona Easter Shoe, 1876 to 1897, is known as the Greenbrier Ghost. Local history recorded that she died mysteriously shortly after her marriage. It was assumed that she died of natural causes until her spirit appeared in a dream to her mother and accused her husband, Edward Shue, of murder. The mother, Mary Heaster, said that her daughter appeared to tell her how the husband, a blacksmith, broke her neck in a fit of rage. <laughs> the body was exhumed and, examined, and an examination supported Mary Heaster's account. Edward Shue was found guilty of murder and sentenced to the state prison at Moundsville. So he was convicted by a ghost. I think that's a great story. So with that, um, I hope you all have some questions or comments and we'll be glad to try to answer or respond. Thank you so much. Do you have uh, any uh, favorite courthouses that you've been in? I would have to say, and it's not because one of my board members who's Wyoming County Circuit Clerk, but um, I used to go to Wyoming County a lot on a previous job, and they started rehabbing their courthouse sooner than that. I mean, they really, in their small county, and they were doing beautiful work on it, and it's really, really lovely inside and out, and it sits on a hill above Pineville. It's very impressive. So. That was really probably the first courthouse that I really became aware of. Boy, they're really fixing this place up nicely. And I grew up in Fayette County. Fayette has a beautiful courthouse. I have an old friend here from Oakville. So uh, that, that's a lovely courthouse with a beautiful lawn outside. So, but th those are a couple just stand out in my mind. I have a comment on the in Wyoming County, when the battle, uh, Oceana was the first first town, in, first, first settlers came to Oceana in Wyoming County, and uh, had the courthouse until 1850. Uh, I mean, 1850 we found it. We had the court. Oceana had the courthouse until 1912. There were several elections on. They went all the way to West Virginia Supreme Court, and right as Pineville won the election, finally got the courthouse. The brand new town of Mala, the railroad came there. So Mollins is suddenly an industrial place on the edge of Raleigh County. And Mollins wanted that courthouse. Badly, but you know, courthouses mean you're going to grow and you're going to last. Now Mollins is one of the, probably the town that's going downhill the fastest because the courthouse is not there and the railroad is no big deal now. But so how bitter those things get. One comment is that if you go to Oceana today or talk to the folks who come to the courthouse, they talk about when Pineville stole our courthouse. They still believe it. <laughs> <laughs> And the other thing is, Mullins wanted that courthouse so badly that the faction of Mullins went to the people in Oceana, and they almost decided to split the county in two. They met in Summers County. They were going to hold a new election. Oceana and, and Mullins were going to vote to give the courthouse to Mullins. And then Oceana was going to petition the county government to split the county. And they were going to split the line right down the middle of Pineville. And make Pineville be half in one and half in the other to never rise again. And at the last minute, uh, over in Summers County, there was a big brawl and they got in a fight. I don't know what the deal was over. I haven't found that date yet. But they actually ended up, in, and of course now the courthouse is and remains in, in Pineville, the center of the county. Probably should have been there. It wasn't the center 
forgetting because OCM was the only place that had people in it. You know, they lost it. Still, but that, that it was stolen from the back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, speaking of the splitting county seats, I just learned this. I was getting some data from other states um, for an article that was recently in the state journal. And I did not know this. There are states whose counties have dual seats. Um, Colorado was one. I, uh, that's, that's one I remember for sure. I don't want to name others. I might be wrong about the other one, but that's one. Where there, it was such a battle that they just gave up. And there's two <laughs> counties. I, I did not know that that existed. I believe Tucker County underwent a similar split. I think the, the records were stolen one night from St. George and taken to Thomas. Um, my family is like a turnip, the best parts in the ground. My triple great grandfather was Henry St. George Tucker, the Tucker County name for him, the town of Henry and St. George. So the St. George component lost one night when all the records were moved, I guess, to Thomas. But it, emphasizes the importance of, of the county courthouse, of that seat of power, and as you say, of the architecture of those uh, buildings that, where most of the pride of the county resides. Did, did you grow up in Tucker County? I grew up in Wilmington, Delaware. Okay. Um, I just, I know an old man who tells that story. Well, actually he's been dead 30 years now, I guess, but he told the story of the great fight yeah. When the courthouse was stolen in Tucker County, he was bitter to look. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fortunate to, as an architect to work in Tucker County and, and uh, work on older buildings there, uh, the Western uh, Maryland uh, building where they did payroll we did try to restore that. And, uh, there a lot of, there's a lot of beautiful historic architecture in West Virginia and most of it resides in, in the courthouse. So I, I agree with you and your assessment of how important it is to keep those buildings. And a county seat is guaranteed business. I mean, there will be law offices, there will be a diner, stuff like that. So it, it, it is a, it's an economic hub as well. And um, now we, we did get a lot of pictures for the book. And, and I am not the author of the book. Deb and Richard Warwick are the author and had to sift through hundreds and hundreds of pictures. We, we made a conscious decision somewhat to avoid the really negative and, and one of those was the social gatherings that hangings became. They, it, it, there's just no way you can make that not look gruesome. I don't care if they're having a picnic. It's gruesome. <laughs> so, but um, hangings were a social event um, as, as were many other events. Houses, but we, we tended not to focus on the negative. And uh, that segues into uh, one of our most historic courthouses is McDowell County. And that is one that we, we not we, me, but just sort of the group, decision to not include it in the movie, even though it's got the Hatfield McCoy history, um, because it is, it is in rough it's just, it, we did not want to do anything that would not, not make the county look good. And it, it, the, the courthouse needs a lot of work. And, and McDowell County is one of the poorest counties in the entire country now. It used to be thriving, um, but it's, it's had a, a turn of luck. And, and the courthouse is in a bit of a state of disrepair. So while it's probably one of our more historic courthouses, we, we did not include that. On the other hand, you showed the Jefferson County courtroom, and that Jefferson, the Jefferson County courthouse is very much true to its original condition, and that is the uh, courtroom where the John Brown trial was heard. So one of the big trials that could have been in McDowell or McDowell County. Yes. Actually, it was transferred to yeah. uh, the Jefferson because mm -hmm. somebody, they didn't figure it Well, who knows what would happen? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that was a long trip back then because yeah. it was still a long trip. Most of these places were built before the advent of air conditioning. Of course, that was probably a pretty significant challenge in trying to incorporate that. But, but even more recently, the need for humidity control 
for a lot of reasons. Uh, that's bound to be another piece. Uh, well, I think you might address that. Yeah, we, we, did, uh, we did discuss that a lot. And if you see a lot of the photographs of the courthouses, you'll see the air conditioners hanging out half the windows. Uh, and in the, 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 right, the mechanical engineer who was with us on the project uh, came up with some pretty creative ideas and recommendations. Obviously, we didn't provide funding for anything, but there are some ways uh, to introduce air conditioning and heating into the buildings that do not damage it as much as they have in the past. Uh, one, one method would be to uh, use what's called the uh, VFR, VRF variable refrigerant system. Uh, so you're only inserting a pipe about that big, and then you have an outlet in each room uh, that heats or cools a coil that then gets distributes air into the room, rather than have big ducts that go throughout the entire building. So that there are, modern technology is good when it's used properly, and sometimes it's bad, as you saw on some of the slides. Uh, um, Romney, and I'm trying to remember the county. Uh, Hampshire. Hampshire. Uh, and I can't remember the second one. And, and Hampshire is, is, I think, our only county with the Shire in the, that was mentioned in the, in the I don't think any of us Coalfield, Southern Coalfield counties, used coal. I don't think but so. But we'd still have a coal <laughs> bin for shooting and all that. Building coal dust. Comment about functionality. Several of the more populous counties have, in addition to the traditional, original, or latest version of the original courthouse, courthouse annexes where they're often have very functional courtrooms. Kanawha County is one, Putnam County is one. Then you have the historic building that, at least for the courtroom, is often ceremonial. Uh, Barber County, when I had seen the movie, had not been to it, had the good fortune of having a hearing there just recently and not only is it as beautiful as you described it is worth the stop if you get a chance but that they had worked their sound system that the acoustics were such you would actually hear in the courtroom because many of the nice looking courtrooms we couldn't have this conversation right. Right. and I, I think Kanawha County's historic courtroom is a it, it still is a it's beautiful Our courthouse, the courtroom is gigantic, and it's outside is massive, locally cut blue sandstone. The inside is stacked stone, and they use some kind of like a horsehair cloth. Anybody know what that's talking about? Mm -hmm. And the stones, of course, are gapped. I mean, it's just like you stacked them up. There's no concrete in it. Yeah. I was stunned because in 1980 I watched them drop the ceiling and panel everything as a kid, and then uh, four or five years ago, I guess, 2006. We put it back the way it was, but we put regular paneling. I'm not paneling, but uh, I, I, whatever it was, it wasn't that horse hair stuff. So those old guys knew what they were doing. You could hear in the old courtroom. We suddenly redid it, and the very first trial was a farce. It was incredible. I'm like, what? Huh? I mean, literally. It was like in front of the judge said, that's it, that's it. we got to do something. And he canceled court, and they brought these big panels in. So those old guys knew how to make you hear in a courtroom. At least today in Wyoming, you can't, and they did that was only 1917, I guess, but, uh, but we blew it in, in 2006 <laughs> and had to redo it. I was going to comment on the HVAC question. Uh, we are helping fund a new HVAC system in Nicholas County this year, and it's a $600,000 project. But we only gave them $100,000, so the counties have to come up with $500,000. Is that one of the newer They had they had a system, so they at least had already ran the network and stuff. So yeah, so that it would probably be more even more for a, another courthouse that didn't actually have uh, a more recent system. I think theirs was maybe thirty years old or so. I want to thank you all very much for your attention and your your questions and comments. And we have stuff for you. Um, the, if you'd like to take a poster, again, this was a result.
result of, of getting so many good pictures of courthouses. So you're welcome to take a poster and a, and a bookmark. And I I can't give away the books or DVDs because trust me, books books and DVDs are expensive. I learned a lot in this project, um, but we we. Um, the special workshop price of $30 for the book. They're normally $35 and, and $5 for the DVD if you'd like one of those. And if you um, want one but, but forgot your money, you can, you can order them on, at wvcounties.org on our website. So, but you're welcome to take a bookmark and a, and a poster with you. Thank you all very much.